Lord, we pray that uh, we would know you, we'd know your presence, we'd know you speaking to us, we'd know you challenging us, changing us, encouraging us as we look at your word. We pray that you'd help us to see Jesus more clearly, help us to see our need of him and to stay close to him and to rely on him and to be changed by him more and more into his glorious nature. Lord, to be the godly men and women uh, that you want us to be. Uh, for we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, we're starting to look at the next section of Luke's Gospel. And uh, so far Jesus has been revealing who he is, that he is the Son of God, he is the Messiah, he's the Saviour, and what he's come to do, that he's come to die on the cross. And we're in the next section now of how do you find eternal life in Jesus? And this section starts in the passage we're looking at this morning. And it finishes in chapter 18 with the same question. It's a bit like a sandwich. You know, you've got two pieces of bread. And uh, but a sandwich is no good without a nice filling, is it? Whatever you want. Whether it's going to be cheese and tomato or cheese and onion or, or ham or, or weirder combinations. <laughs> uh, I remember when I was growing up, my, 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 my favourite sandwich, which was a treat on a Sunday afternoon, was a demerara sugar sandwich. Yeah, that is going out most people. Peanut, so. butter Peanut butter and banana. Pork pie and pickle. Pork no. pie and pickle sandwich. Yeah. 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 <laughs> there we go. Well, well, the, the, the two pieces of bread, as it were, is this question. It's the same question here in uh, chapter 10, verse 25. And then the rich young ruler asks exactly the same question in chapter 18. Good teacher, what must I do to be saved. And, and, and the whole of this next section is, what do you need to do to be saved? Or we could put it, if you've done this, you will be saved. Or you are saved. Uh, listen to the lyrics of an Ed Sheeran song. I gave all my oxygen to people that could breathe. I gave away my money, and now we don't even speak. I drove miles and miles, but would you do the same for me? Oh, honestly. Offered up my shoulder just for you to cry upon. Gave you constant shelter and a bed to keep you warm. They gave me the heartache, and in return I gave them a song. And it goes on and on. Life can get you down, so I just numb the way it feels. I drown it out with drink and out-of-date prescription pills. And all the ones that love me, they just left me on the shelf. No farewell. So before I save someone else, I've got to save myself. But if I don't, then I'll go back to where I'm rescuing a stranger. Just because they needed saving. Just like that. Oh, I'm here again between the devil and the danger. But I guess it's just my nature. Uh, I guess it's just my nature. My dad was wrong because I'm not like my mum because she'd just smile and I'm complaining in a song. But it helps. So before I save someone else, I've got to save myself. Life can get you down. So I just numb the way it feels or drown it with a drink and out of date prescription pills. That's actually a lot of people, isn't it? Can't save themselves can't change themselves, can't get themselves out of the pit that they've dug, so they numb the pain. There's a couple we spoke to Friday, Friday morning, there with their cans, man in and out of uh, homes since he was little, care homes. Uh, listen to an even more bleak one. This is, uh, this is from a rapper. I know your life is empty and you hate to face this world alone. So you're searching for an angel, someone who can make you whole. I cannot save you. I can't even save myself. So you better save yourself. 
I know that you've been damaged, your soul has suffered abuse, but I'm not your saviour, I'm just messed up as you. I cannot save you, I can't even save myself. So just save yourself. Please don't take pity on me. My life has been a nightmare. My soul is fractured to the bone. If I must be lonely, I think I'd rather be alone. You cannot save me. You can't even save yourself. I cannot save you. I can't even save myself. So save yourself. Save yourself. Well, that's pretty hopeless, isn't it? But actually, that's the mantra of so much of the world. And we live in a very selfish, individualistic world. I can't save myself, so you better save yourself. Well, if you can't save yourself, how can anyone else save themselves? But here's this man, and he's a religious man, and he studies the Bible religiously, and he teaches the Bible religiously. And he comes up to Jesus, but he's not genuine. He's a fake, because it says an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. So he's not really interested in finding out what Jesus thinks. He's trying to trip Jesus up because he thinks Jesus is a fraud and a phony. So this man wants to test Jesus and he does it openly and publicly because he wants to show openly and publicly that Jesus is a fraud, that Jesus is a con man, that Jesus is getting it wrong. And so he says, he stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Actually, that, that's what, if, if anyone believes in eternity in God, and actually most people still believe in God, and most people still want to go to their heaven they they think that they can do stuff to get to heaven you talk to most people they go well by and large i'm, I'm a good person I, I try my hardest to be good and i i try to be a good neighbor and uh, i give to charity sometimes and uh, you know i don't get into trouble with the police and i pay my taxes and uh, you know i i help in the social club or whatever uh, I, I sell poppies when it comes to uh, to uh, uh, in November, uh, and uh, you, I'm, I'm, I'm a good person. So Jesus answers. So this man is is examining Jesus. He's testing Jesus, but he's not really interested in the answer. He's 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 not doing it honestly. Jesus examines the man's knowledge of the Bible. So Jesus always takes us back to the Bible because God doesn't contradict himself. God doesn't say one thing in the Bible and then something different through Jesus. God doesn't say one thing through the Bible and then different through the Holy Spirit and someone standing up and saying, the Lord has said to me. God doesn't contradict himself. And so Jesus tests this religious teacher's knowledge of the Bible. And Jesus says, well, what's written in the law? Because Jesus didn't come to take away the law. Jesus came to fulfill the law. In fact, Jesus says heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will never pass away. It is of infinite standing. So Jesus says, well, what's written in the Bible? Um, that's why it's always important to be looking at the Bible, whether it's on the screen or in front of you, whenever, whenever anyone preaches. Because it's not what the preacher says that it's important, it's what God's word says that's important. And if the preacher gets boring, well, the Bible's always way more interesting anyway. So Jesus said, what's written in the law? How do you read it? How do you interpret it? Why does Jesus do that? Well, God's word is a mirror to our souls. God's word will never lie to us. It always shows us what we are really like. Because our problem is we, we think we're way better than we really are. On the inside. We think we're good. We think we're nice. We think we're kind. We think we're loving. We think we're, we're worthy. 
Jesus says, well, what does the Bible say? What does the law of God say? How, how do you understand it? The man answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And elsewhere, Jesus says, actually, those words sum up the entire law of God. All the moral law and the ceremonial law, they sum it all up. And, uh, and this teacher of the law, he knows his Bible. He's quoting from Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And, uh, and he's thoroughly right. But he's thoroughly wrong. Because what was his question? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, the Bible is very plain, very clear. You tell me what the Bible says. The man says, yeah, I understand what the Bible says. Love God with every fiber of your being, with every thought, with every word, with every desire, with every attitude, with every action, with, with every plan, Every second of every day from the moment you're born to the moment you die. That's what you've got to do for you to inherit eternal life. Pass that one? No. No. So what does that show you what you like? Spiritually an utter failure. Spiritually so far from God's standard. Oh, and love your neighbor in exactly the same way that you love yourself. With every fiber of your being, with every thought, thought, with every desire, with every attitude, with every action, every moment of every day. If you want to get to heaven by what you do, and it is possible, the Bible holds it out. <laughs> This is how you've got to be. And the man understands what Jesus is saying. Jesus says, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. You will, you will gain eternal life. And the man goes, mm. And he realizes no chance. But he's a religious teacher. So he goes, well, do you know, I think I've passed the first one. Because I'm a religious teacher and I've dedicated my whole life to, uh, to teaching the Bible. I think I've passed the first one, but I'm not doing so well on the second one. But he doesn't openly admit it. It says he wanted to justify himself. And so he asked Jesus, well, who's my neighbor? We, we have a terrible capacity for self-deception. Human beings do. And, and, and just like this man, we, we think we're better than we are. And when something or someone shows us that we're not as good as we think we are, we, we then try and justify ourselves by going, but I'm not as bad as them. I, I, I'm not a murderer. I'm not a paedophile. I'm, I'm not a thief. I'm not as bad as them. Now, how this man justifies himself, because he wants to feel good about himself, and it, remember, he's going to get to heaven by what he does, so he's got to be seen to be good and passing God's exam. So he goes, well... Who is my neighbour? He's going, there's got to be wiggle room. There's got to be a way of escape. See, God can't possibly mean that my neighbour is everyone. No, no, no. My neighbour is people who I like. Because, you know, you don't live, you don't choose to live by people you don't like. You don't choose to have people in your home who you don't like. So, so his thinking is, you see, well... 
Yeah, my neighbour, Jesus, my neighbour, God must mean that my neighbour's people like me and people who like me and therefore I like them. So Jesus tells this parable. And, and first and foremost, this is where we've got to understand the context of the parable. You see, this parable is not saying to Christians, you really need to try harder to be nice to everyone. Because what was the question? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And the Bible's saying, you can't do it. Because God's standards are way, way higher than actually sinners are capable of achieving. And so don't con yourself, don't kid yourself, don't lie to yourself, don't deceive yourself to think that you are going to be able to do enough. That's the context of this parable. And this parable is to hit home how demanding, how exacting God's standards are if you want to do enough to get to heaven by your efforts. And Jesus says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he fell into the hand of robbers. Um, have you ever done that road, John? Have you done Jerusalem to Jericho? Yes, I haven't. I've done the original road. It's not an easy road, is it? Well, well, no, the modern road is now, but if you get to, close to Wadi uh, which is the stream that runs down through, and you just get on the road by the side of it, it's not an easy road. It's not an easy road at all, and in these days, no tarmac roads. <laughs> it, it was a difficult, dangerous journey. And Jerusalem is up high, Jericho is, is down low, and Jericho is a very nice place to live. And, it, and it's where the major, well, a great number of the priests and the Levites, who were the temple singers and the, the ones who did all the practical work in the temple to keep it going day to day, it's where they lived. But they didn't work full time in the temple, they worked on a rotor system. Remember Zechariah and Elizabeth? When it was his time to go and serve in the temple, he was chosen by Lot to be the one who would go in and offer incense and the prayers. You see, they, they didn't work full time. There were so many priests and Levites by Jesus' time, there was a rotor. So they're constantly going backwards and forwards from Jericho to Jerusalem to serve in the temple. Now, so who's Jesus talking to? Who's asked him the question? A teacher of the law who would have... So don't, don't just think they were singing hymns and stuff. You know, there would be Bible studies going on, teaching the law in the temple. The temple was a big place. There were lots of different courts where Bible studies would be going on publicly and out in the open. And so Jesus says, a priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he, when he a priest, a religious man who's meant to be teaching them about the law and the Lord and meant to be a godly example. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. He doesn't even bother to have a look. He doesn't even draw close. He, he sees the man all beaten up and, and left half dead and he passes on. We're not told why. Well, we know why. He's selfish. It it's, could, could put him in danger. It's going to mean that he's got to put himself out. It could be, you know, well, I, I don't know how long this is going to take and, and how much of my time and my effort and my resources and my time's valuable and, and I've got to get to Jericho. And well, those robbers might still be around and I'll be in danger. So he passes by. At this point, the crowd would be. <gasps> yeah, it's like Jesus saying the Archbishop of Canterbury walked past and didn't help. Mm. Or the Dalai Lama looked, walked past, didn't help. So too, a Levite, so here's one of the temple singers, the, the church worship leader, got his guitar <laughs> over his back, got his amp in its carrying case. He does a little bit better. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, well, at least he goes and has a look at him. Actually, that's what it says in the original text. He actually took time to actually go and have a close look. 
he passed by on the other side as well. So the church worship leader goes, this is going to be too much. It's too much for me. Now, so far, these three guys, the one who's robbed and beaten up, and the Levite and the priest, they're all Jews. They're God's people. It's no help. That the penny would have been starting to drop now in the crowd that's listening. Ordinary believers would have gone, well, if a Levite wouldn't have helped and a priest wouldn't have helped and we get to heaven by what we do, well, what chance is there for me? And Jesus rams it home then. He says, but a Samaritan, the whole crowd would have been going, See, they didn't even like to say the word Samaritan because they hated them. It would be like today, Jesus saying this and saying, but a Palestinian came by. Uh, when I preached this in India, I'd say, but a Pakistani Muslim came by. Well, you've seen what? Tension there is even in Leicester at the moment between Pakistanis and Muslims. And that's over a cricket match because actually it's not over a cricket match. Their hearts are deceitful and sinful and selfish and we don't like people who are not like us. A Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and he bandaged his wounds and he poured on oil and wine. That takes time. That takes effort. That takes sacrifice. He then put the man on his own donkey. So now instead of him being carried by the donkey, he's having to walk by the side of the donkey. And this man is on his donkey now. The crowd would have been, because the, the Jews hated the Samaritans, and ordinarily the Samaritans hated the Jews. So we know that, don't we? Because when Jesus went to the well in Samaria, and he says to the woman, woman, give me something to drink. She says, you, a Jew, are asking me, a Samaritan, for a drink, for the Jews have nothing to do with the Samaritans. And vice versa. The Samaritans have nothing to do with the Jews. Because if someone hates you and they would destroy you at the drop of a hat, it's not going to be your ordinary thinking and behaviour to help your enemy. If they curse you and abuse you, I mean, look, when someone insults you, what's your first thought without even thinking? Someone says something nasty to you, What's your natural instinct? You let them have it back with both barrels, don't you? That's, that's human nature. If practically they're doing stuff to harm you, well, your nature is not going to be to do the complete opposite. It's, you do bad stuff to me, I'm going to do bad stuff to you. That's, that's why the world is the way that it is. He brought him to an inn and took care of him the next day, he took out two silver coins, two days' wages. Ooh, now we're talking cost, aren't we? What's an average day's wage in the UK? Do you know? Well, the average wage in the UK is just over £28,000. It's a little bit less in Wales. Do the maths. Several hundred pounds. The man goes to the innkeeper, here's a couple of hundred quid, and if it costs more to look after this man, whatever it was, next time I come, I'll pay that as well. I'm willing to put my hand in my pocket to help my enemy. <clears throat> now remember the question is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, this is what the law of God says. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, 
and with all your mind and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Well, you love yourself with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. That's why you look after yourself. That's why you feed yourself. That's why you groom yourself. That's why you buy yourself nice clothes instead of clothes that are falling apart. That's why you wash your clothes because you love yourself. And if you wear dirty, smelly clothes, well, it's not going to do you any good. That's why you live in a nice, comfortable home because you love yourself. And Jesus says, if you want to get to heaven by what you do, that's how you've got to treat everyone else as well. All the time. Not just one-offs when you feel like it, all the time. Here's the examination. Which of these three do you think was a neighbour? Remember, love your neighbour as you love yourself. Which of these was a neighbour to the man who fell in with robbers? Now, th this, is, this is where it shows that this cut, this religious teacher to the heart, he can't even bear to say the word Samaritan. He, he just won't let it on his lips because it's, it's dirty and it's ugly and it's hateful. So he says, the one who had mercy on him. See, so what's Jesus showing this man? His heart is not loving at all. His heart is hateful. To people who are not like him. Jesus says, if you want to get to heaven by what you do, if you want to get you, earn yourself into God's good books, this is God's standard. Love God with everything you've got all the time and love your worst enemy with everything you've got all the time. Jesus said, go and do likewise. You... Your question is, what must I do to, to, to gain eternal life? Well, go and be like that man. Is that possible? Well, let's put it this way. Have you passed or failed? Do you pass or fail every day? We fail every day. So remember, this whole section of Luke's Gospel is saying, you can't do anything to inherit eternal life. You can't do it. Now, there's someone way better than the Samaritan, and he's done it all. We were the ones, if you want, going away from Jerusalem, going away from God's dwelling place, going away from worshipping the true living God because we were worshipping ourselves. But Jesus came. He was crucified with robbers. He was beaten up. He was stripped and left naked on the cross. He wasn't rescued. He died for you and me. And he rose again so that all our sin, and sin is to be falling short of God's standard, and his God's standard, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind, love your enemy as you love yourself. And, and we, even at our best moment, we, we aim for that target and we fall way, way short. That's what the word sin actually means. It's to fall short of God's standard. That's why it says in Romans, all have fallen short of God's glory. But did Jesus? No. What does he pray for his enemies on the cross, naked and bleeding and dying? Father, forgive them because they do not know what they're doing. See, Jesus is way better than the Good Samaritan because the Good Samaritan is a parable Jesus is true. Jesus is real. The Good Samaritan is just a story to ram home to us that we are utter failures in the spiritual realm and we cannot do anything to earn eternal life. But Jesus has done it all. He lived the life loving his enemies 
like he loved himself. In fact, he loved his enemies more than he loved himself because he laid down his life for his enemies. So he valued you and me more than his own life. And he did love the Lord his God with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his strength, and with all his might. All the time. From all eternity to eternity. He did it for us. And so this whole section in Luke's gospel, starting here, is saying, nothing you can do, and you don't need to, to inherit eternal life, because Jesus has done it all for you. But that doesn't let us off the hook. Because God's word still stands. Love the Lord your God. As a believer now, as someone who trusts in the Lord Jesus, Jesus has done everything to purchase my eternal inheritance in heaven, to purchase my forgiveness, to purchase my salvation, to purchase eternal life for me. He's the perfect sacrifice, the perfect man. Yes, he's done that, but God's word still stands for his people. Because Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, the reality is, you know you're always going to fall short. But the difference is, because this Jesus loves me and he's given everything for me, I want to show my love for him in my obedience to him. Listen to what Charles Wesley said. Now, we just sang Charles Wesley's song. Charles Wesley, the son of an Anglican minister, brought up knowing the scriptures, went to Oxford University, and he was just like this teacher of the law. He was dead serious about keeping the law of God because he thought only if you keep the law methodically, that's where the term Methodist comes from, and actually that was a insult by all the other Oxford students who had spent their time drinking and gambling and horse racing. But here were the Wesley brothers and George Whitfield who would study the Bible methodically and then try and live out the Bible methodically, seriously, visiting the prisoners in prison in Oxford, going to the hospitals and the poor houses and trying to do good. But their motivation was, you see, only if we do this methodically can we obtain eternal life. And then, the, then uh, the, the Wesley brothers said, right, we're going to become missionaries to the Indians in North America because they need to know about this Jesus. And the boat they're on, terrible storm, and they are terrified they're going to die. But there were some Moravian missionaries in the boat. And in the middle of the storm, with, with these Methodists who studied the Bible and were dead serious about it, who were terrified they're dying. Here's these Moravians, the early Baptists, if you want, praising God in the middle of the storm, knowing that if they die, they're going to go to heaven. And, and Wesley was like, what have they got that we haven't got? Then he went on to be, a, him and his brother went to be missionaries to the Indians. Utter disaster. And they, they came back after a few years thinking, we are utter failures. We, 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 we didn't reach a single Indian. We, we, we haven't changed anyone. And they, they came back and uh, there's these Moravians. And uh, they're doing Bible studies and having meetings in London. And, uh, and the Wesleys hear about it and they decide to go. And uh, Wesley had just purchased Luther's commentary on Galatians. And in the introduction, it says you cannot be saved by what you do. You can only be saved by trusting in what Christ has already done. And, uh, and they go there, and, and his Moravians, and they're, they're reading Luther's commentary on Galatians. And that's where this hymn comes in. Thine I diffused a wondrous light. My heart was... You just sang the words. My heart was changed. The chains fell off. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. He says later on in his diaries, he says, in that moment of hearing of Christ's life and death for me, 
my heart was strangely warmed and I was set free. But that's talking about salvation. That's talking about how you inherit eternal life. You realize you can't do it. Jesus has done everything. But then, listen, th these are uh, words to uh, Wesley gave to... Oh, sorry, I'm trying to... All young Christians. So he would give guidance notes when someone gave their life to Jesus. Do all the cat or do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. Not to gain salvation. You've already got it. But in a response, in a worshipful, grateful response to what Jesus has already done for you, and in a worshipful, loving response to what God's, God's word says. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind, with all your soul. Now, there are, there are, we, we fall into the trap, don't we? Yeah, I'll come to church and I'll worship God because he's nice. And he's good, and he's good, and he's worthy of, of my worship and serving him. Oh, but the Christians are a pain in the butt. They rub me up the wrong way. And that's the Christians. And what about the people outside who just hate my saviour and, and, and uh, got no time for Jesus and no time for God and use my Jesus' name as a swear word and, uh, and, 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 you know. No, Jesus says, if you love me, so here's the first commandment, love God with all your heart, soul. If you love me, you will keep my commandments which is to love your neighbor and who is your neighbor no your worst enemy that's the catch-all your neighbor is your worst enemy that doesn't take much to think about does it who's the person who's rubbing you up the wrong way at the moment who's the person who's making your life a pain at the moment who's the one who's taking you for granted at the moment love them as you love yourself, and this is your acceptable worship. But it's not one-off. It's not, I've done that now. No, 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 no. Love the Lord your God with all. So how, how often have you got to do this? All the time. This has got to be our settled attitude before God now can you do that without Jesus because what is your love compared to Jesus's love it's not it's not even worth comparing is it you know that's why we are to be channels of Jesus's love and we cannot love like Jesus wants us to love without the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit what's the fruit of the Spirit love you can't love like Jesus loves unless you're praying that the Holy Spirit will fill you each day with Jesus' love. And then the people go, yeah, I love them, but I, you know, I, I will love, but I will do it stoically. But I will do it sacrificially. And I will do it because it's, it's my service. No, 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 no. Love, joy. There's to be joy. We're to be filled with joy, loving and serving our enemies. Helping even our enemies. Not, well, I'm doing it because Jesus tells me to do it, but I don't really want to do it. But this is my worship. No. Love, joy. Oh, you see, then there's that, well, what's the point of me doing all this for my enemy because they're going to throw it back in my face and it's, no, it's going to be no good. It's going to be a waste of time. Well, there's no peace in thinking like that, is there? So you have to have the peace of Jesus in your heart, knowing that you're doing what he wants you to do and leave the results with him, but you're doing it for him. Oh, but they're going to take you, they're going to take you for granted. And it's going to be a black hole. Love, joy, peace. 
patience. You patiently keep on loving your enemy and doing them good, even when they're throwing it in your face. And you can't do it unless you're being filled with the Spirit and bearing the fruit of the Spirit. And then, of course, there's the danger of, aren't I doing it so well? Aren't I such a good person? Aren't I such a good Christian? Well, that's not meekness, is it? That's pride. And so, you know, we need to be filled with the Spirit every day so that we will do it meekly, humbly. Of course, and then there's always a danger when you put yourself in that position that it's just going to catch you at the wrong moment. In that just that place where you're a little bit vulnerable and it's a little bit painful and you're trying your hardest and you're loving your enemy and then they just get you where it was a little bit raw and then what happens? Boom! So what do you need to be filled with? What's the last fruit of the Holy Spirit? <coughs> Self-control. See, you need Jesus for your salvation because you can't do it you'll never hit the grade and and even once you've got jesus for your salvation you can't actually obey and love him without his enabling by the holy spirit it's impossible and and you know you you and how often do you need to be filled with the holy spirit every day because you're like a sieve you and i are a spiritual hive sieve we're not holy, we're holy. I'd get away with that in Wales, you see, because uh, oh, I'm a whole person. We're not holy, we're holy. We are leaky sieves spiritually. And you can be like this one day, and the next day you forget us to ask the Lord to fill you with his spirit, and then you are completely the opposite. Like which drives us back to, I cannot get to God I cannot earn inheritance in eternity by what I do. Because even at my best, even at a Christian, even who's serious about these things, I fall and fail daily. So what must I do to inherit eternal life? Don't trust yourself. I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. But can we live like this? Uh, it was always a great challenge to me. The hospital administrator in, in Catchworth, this Shankar. And uh, he was out um, to get... Uh, medical certification for one of our departments in the hospital and that's always a nightmare it takes days and days and days of just sitting in the office uh, and they're waiting for you to pay a bribe and you're waiting for them to realize that you're a christian and you don't pay a bribe and it's a game that, that is played so it is terrible frustration and everything else and they play on that because they think hopefully you'll get so frustrated that principles will go out the window you'll pay your bribe and then they'll give you the certificate anyway so this, this has been going on for three days and, uh, and he decides, oh, I'm just going to go for a walk, uh, clear my head, instead of just sitting in this stuffy office. And, uh, and this, this lady, uh, elderly lady, she's naked, uh, covered in flies, covered in her own excrement at the side of the road. Uh, she, she's uh, with a broken arm. Uh, the lo she's not a local, so the locals don't want anything to do with her. And they really are sort of standing on the other side of the road because she's not one of them. And she's dirty and filthy and... And, uh, and, well, she's obviously ill, and, and if they take her to the hospital, well, they're going to have to pay, so they don't want to get into debt for someone they don't know. And he sees her, and he picks her up, puts her in the hospital vehicle, brings her home, washes her himself. In fact, he washed her before he got in to get into the vehicle. He found a, a hand pump, and he, he washed her. Uh, get, brings her into the vehicle, brings her to the hospital, and uh, she's cared for and looked after, and... Uh, but no one understands what she's saying because she's not a local. She's and uh, anyway, so she all she can say is this that everyone understands is the name of the village that she's from. So my friend goes on the internet, goes on Facebook, 
and finds out there's even a Facebook page for this village, and this village is in Gujarat, which is why no one understood what she was saying, because she was speaking Gujarati. She's talking 700,000 miles away. Yeah. 700 to 1,000 miles away. Yeah. And uh, anyway, a few days later, we get a message on Facebook. I, I think I know this woman, and I think I know her son. Turned out a son had put her on a train for her to go home, and, and she, got, and she got, got off at a station to go to the toilet, and, uh, and the train had gone by the time she finished in the toilet, and then she just started wandering around. And, uh, a, she got hit, by a got hit by a vehicle. She'd used up all her money, and she's dehydrated, so that made her confused, and then she got water infection and, and everything else. And... and well, her son, her son makes contact with the hospital, Hindu family, and then him, him and, and some other family members came to the hospital, came to a Sunday service, heard the gospel, heard the gospel in the hospital because every, every morning in the, the ward starts with prayer and a little Bible study, a little Bible reading and, uh, and some singing of gospel hymns. And they were just so thankful. Oh, but we've got an NHS here. We've got social security. We've got PIPs. We've got universal credit. So we, we don't need to do this anymore. I've heard that said in church. What does the law of God say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. But don't worry about your neighbor now because there's the welfare state. No, the word of God stands. And actually, we're living in a day and age where even the welfare state system is utterly broken. And sadly, we've got a government and a prime minister and a, and a chancellor who want to give money to the richest 1% in the country and let everyone else go to the dogs. Who only want to look after the ones who are like them. And are totally the opposite to what Jesus is saying. And God's word is saying, no, 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 no. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And love your enemy who's the one who is least like you. Like you love yourself. And he doesn't say love them so they'll get saved. He doesn't say love them so they'll come to church. And, you know, it's very easy to fall into that trap as a Christian as well. Oh, well, you see, I loved them and I did them good and they never came to church. And as far as I know, it, no, 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 no. That's not what scripture says, is it? Think of the ten lepers. Did Jesus know only one would come and thank him and worship him? Yes, he's God. He knows everything. Did that stop him helping the other nine? No, he loved the other nine lepers and he healed them as well, even though he knew that they would not come or ever say thank you and praise the Son of God. So here's how we show our worship, our thankfulness, our love for God. We love him and we will fail. We, we don't hit that standard. That's why we need Christ. And we're to love our enemies as we love ourselves and we will fail. That's why we need Christ, but it doesn't take away it doesn't diminish doesn't take away god's standard which we should be aiming for all the time to love our neighbor as we love ourselves he says if you love me you will keep my commands and you won't find them a burden you'll find them a delight lord thank you for your word uh, it's challenging, uh, it's encouraging, and we pray, Lord, that your word would be planted in our hearts, and by your spirit it would bear fruit. Lord, that you would utterly transform us day by day by day, more and more into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is not just God, but is the perfect man, who is the standard, the, the target we're to, we're to set our sights on, and emulate and we know that it's only when we see him that we shall be like him and that's in heaven 
But Lord, you tell, your word also tells us that day by day, uh, as we gaze upon him, we are being transformed from glory into glory. We, be, we are being transformed and we're to be transformed and we're to let our minds be renewed day by day by your word and in the power of your Holy Spirit. For your glory we pray. Amen. Amen.